Well, welcome to everyone. I want to add uh, my excitement about today's event, and we're really grateful that uh, Eric has agreed to join us. Uh, we live today in the time of Zoom, where Zoom has become both a noun and a verb. Uh, we connect virtually with others for business and for pleasure, combating the isolation of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the now commonplace experience that we all have of Zooming can be traced back to the vision of Eric Yuan. As a college student in the 1990s, Eric traveled 10 hours by train to meet his girlfriend, now wife, Sherry. He stated that the idea of video conferencing as a way to stay connected emerged as a result of this experience. At Shandong University of Science and Technology, Eric Yuan went on to study applied mathematics and computer science. He arrived in Silicon Valley in 1997 during the first internet boom. He was 27 years old. In 1997, Eric joined two-year-old WebEx as one of the first 20 hires. 10 years later, WebEx was sold to Cisco. Cisco selected Eric to lead the engineering team at WebEx, but didn't allow him to fulfill his goal of rebuilding and improving the app. In response, Eric took the leap and left Cisco in 2011 to start his own company. 40 fellow engineers followed him. Zoom was launched the following year and the rest, as they say, is history. A history inspired by a question that Eric has said bothered him since he was a child. He asked, what creates happiness? His answer, I had no idea for a long, long time, but finally, I had the epiphany that happiness comes from making others happy, whether it's a community or society or your friends and family. It's now my pleasure to welcome Eric to join us. Hey, Tom. Thank Hi, you. Eric. It's so good to see you. And so I can just imagine how busy you are. So thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I know that there are a lot of people in the audience who, who, who share my enthusiasm. Um, so, so I wanted to start with a few questions before we got to audience questions. Um, and, and I want to ask you a bit, looking back, um, when you applied to come to the US, you were turned down famously eight times uh, before you got a visa. As I recounted, when you uh, started with Cisco, uh, they did not allow you to fulfill your dreams in terms of really developing the kind of app you wanted. Uh, so what kept you going through these times of adversity? I think, uh, first of all, looking back, let's say I, I got a decline 80 times. Looking back, I, I would say it's not a bad thing. It is great to practice my perseverance because oh. I'm not a, a, a kid who like to give up easily for anything. I think it's because I have a dream and, and at any given time, I know what I'm going to, to do, right? So I have a dream. I don't want to give up. I just keep it trying, keep it trying. And luckily, I only tried the next time I got my visa, right? It's, just not, it's not that bad. In terms of, uh, you know, the reason why I left Cisco, I did not think about leaving Cisco. Cisco is a great company, and I was a corporate vice president, president there. The reason why is even if I know, no matter how I'm going to try that, at that time, Every morning when I woke up, I do not feel happy because I did not see a single happy customer. Finally, I had no choice, you know, to leave, to figure out a way to build a new solution to bring happiness back to those customers. Otherwise, I will keep trying to convince others to let me build a new solution. So, right. Well, it's a it, it, it's wonderful that you can deal with adversity in such a positive way, and when and when things work. How do you feel? Is it just okay now? I can move towards my dream, or is it that you uh, uh, that you even start resetting your dreams with the new possibilities? That's great. So every time you have a dream and a probably new dream, the most important thing is is not about your dream is come dream coming true. Because you know even if your dream coming true, you just enjoy that one day or two days. Probably celebrate that. The most important thing is to enjoy the process. That's very important because to achieve in a small dream, a big dream, it could be many years effort. Every day, enjoy that. 
and achieve something, set a new dream, enjoy the process again and again. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's wonderful advice. I, I must confess I'm too goal oriented. So the reminder to be able to, to enjoy the pathway is, is an important one. Um, now, of course, you know, Zoom is an incredible success and, and we're all uh, enjoying the fact that we can stay connected by Zoom, but you still have challenges, but those challenges must be different. So, so, so how do you think about that? And what, what's that like? Yes, yeah, it's a great question. First of all, I don't think we are successful and we just uh, started. I think the future of communication is bright. As I mentioned, right? So if we set up a dream to build a killer app or killer platform, I think that this is a long process. We got, we got to enjoy this process. Sometimes it's ups and downs or, or all kinds of challenges. Like last year, you know, prior to pandemic crisis, you know, we built a service, you know, to focus on enterprise, business or high ed or government customers. We never thought about that. So many consumers like uh, online wedding ceremony, the K-12 schools, how to embrace those brand new use cases. That's very challenging because the way, you know, to, to, to care about those consumers is very different compared to, you know, our, you know, practice to care about the enterprise customers. And plus, I remember the last March and April, and our team, we worked so hard. The reason why is almost every data center, we need to add more capacity. Not only users here, all over the world, right? This is for several months in a row. It's very challenging. Also, the most challenging part is as we further scale our business to care about the customers, we had to hire a lot of employees. Guess what? We never had that experience to onboard our employees remotely. I have a thousand of new employees. We never see each other. And it's a totally different experience. We got to learn from that. It's another challenge. You know, it's probably that's the biggest challenge, you know, because we wanted to maintain our culture. I have so many employees joining us remotely. How to welcome them? Right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the, the biggest challenge we are facing. So do you imagine when, when the world returns to normal, that those employees will then come together at least part of the time and do you have plans for how you would uh, create the right environment and culture for them? I think first of all, the way I look at this, I do not think we are going to go back to the traditional you know, work, uh, working model, meaning we all need to go to office and it's very likely it's hybrid, meaning you know, employee, they can make a decision. Today I want to go to office, tomorrow I want to stay at home. Having said that, you know, for now, I probably uh, I met with so many newly hired employees on Zoom, but still I did not get a chance to shake hands with them and talk with them face to face, you know, how to embrace that. That's also very important. Again, that's going to be very hybrid, you know, in the workplace. Yeah, it, I, I think it's a challenge for so many. I mean, of course, we have students who are we're instructing remotely. I think for the students who've been on campus, they understand what it's like to be part of Caltech, but you think of the freshmen, it's really a hard experience for them. I mean, we, I think they're getting a good education, but those interactions, but I also think their instructional experience will be hybrid as we move forward, as you point out. And, and I think that's a good thing, actually. Yeah, you are so right. I look at it, you know, those uh, students, even for our adults, so I have a lot of employees over the past uh, you know, several months, almost a year now, I would have seen the mental health is number one problem. Mm -hmm. Anxiety, depression, everyone you know, working from home and family, it, it's so hard not to mention to the, the freshmen or the, the, the university students. It's pretty tough, but overall it's a good thing. The reason why in the future, right? How to embrace all those kind of a challenges we are facing, you know, how to move forward. You know, looking back like 10 or 20 years, it's not a bad thing, you know, it will help us. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, and I think that's the right way to look at it. And, uh, you know, you always want to look forward in this fashion. Of course, you have to deal with the present and make sure that, that you get through it in a hum, humane manner. Yep. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about your relationship with customers. I mean, I've been so impressed, uh, you know, reading about your career and 
that you, you meet frequently with customers when you were vice president, as you pointed out, a corporate vice president. A lot of corporate vice presidents don't actually reach out to customers. Um, in the early days of Zoom, you personally emailed every customer who canceled their service. So, so what did you learn from these, these kind of conversations and, and, and how did you apply that knowledge? So one thing I learned you know, since I joined the WebEx in 1997, all the way to the time when I built a Zoom was that no matter what you do, if your customer, if they are not happy, everything else will fall apart very soon. It's very important. We got to, when we build a business, you see have an internal process, a team, talents, a lot of things. We got to understand why we're doing that. We needed to send around one thing, make sure your customer, they are happy. You want to build a trust, and they really want to use your service, give your feedback. That's why the customer is number one important thing. So what are, because you know, that's what I learned you know, when, when I was at Cisco and WebEx, that's why when we you know, started at Zoom and our company culture is to deliver happiness. Meaning for me as a CEO, my, 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 you know, my number one priority is to make sure our employee happy. However, as a business, we need to do all we can to care about the customers, make sure they are happy. Otherwise, quite often we make a great decision. We think that's a great decision. Everyone inside a Zoom, they feel happy. Guess what? At the cost of a customer. And you may not see that, but that's not sustainable. That's why every day we think about it. when we make a decision, we always ask ourselves, will this decision benefit our customers or not? If not, we are not going to make that decision. That's why customers' happiness is number one important thing to build a sustainable business. So the, do you get, uh, if you do a Zoom wedding, do you sometimes get pictures and things like that? Do you see that part of the interaction with your customers as well? Quite often, I had a meeting with some of the users' customers. They all joking around, hey, Eric, I heard about Zoom married. It's illegal in New York now. Unfortunately, we already got married. Otherwise, we want to try that experience. <laughs> and so yeah. a lot of new use cases like that. I want to learn, hey, why I like this feature? why they think this use case is, is going to become mainstream. And then I can you know, share that feedback you know, back to our product or engineer team, how to double down on that use case. You know, like I added some fun features because the wedding ceremony is very important. That's why we added uh, the, the reactions and the emojis and uh, you know, very cool the virtual background to have those uh, use cases as well. Mm -hmm. So you, you came to Silicon Valley now almost 25 years ago. Um, so tell us about your first impressions and, and, and how things have changed. Oh, that's a, that's a great experience. And uh, since then, I remember that I landed in San Francisco airport, I think that's August 1997. And, you know, that's the first wave of internet revolution. And uh, I call Silicon Valley the startup valley. And uh, there's so many great leaders in Silicon Valley. And the entrepreneurs, we see uh, the, the, the retired CEOs. And the reason why I like Silicon Valley is because Silicon Valley has the best culture. It does embrace diversity. And all those leaders, they want to help out, you know, to, to, to contribute back to the community, to local society. Because, uh, you know, over the past 23 or 25 years, and uh, even if I do not know those leaders, if I reach out to them, they all want to help. So that's, uh, I would say, number one reason why Silicon Valley is so successful and care about each other. And uh, even today, I think the Silicon Valley culture is getting better and better. I really, I also I live in Silicon Valley and that's so fortunate. So, so the, you know, you read a lot about the fact that Silicon Valley has become very much, very crowded and, and harder to uh, live in and all that. But, but this culture of, of collaboration, of interaction has survived all that in, in your view. It's getting even better, I think, because yeah. no any other places I would say even close to this culture. And because it's many years effort for many, many leaders, everyone got to care about each other, care about the community, embrace the diversity and focus on the innovation, entrepreneurship, I, I think it's seriously, I think that the culture of Silicon Valley is getting better and better every year. Yeah. 
The, so I have another cultural question for you, but a little different about, about Zoom culture. And, and, and you've written that the harshest criticism may be the best words you ever hear. Um, in, in a big company though, of course, it, it's, and, and Zoom is getting bigger and bigger, sometimes you get isolated and it's hard to hear those words. So, so how do you make sure that, that the culture is such that, that people do tell you what's wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. By the way, that's a quote is from uh, the former CEO of Walmart, H. Lee Scott. Oh, I see. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, it just sounded like something that you would say. <laughs> learned from, learned from, and uh, he's, and, yeah, the story was that when I was at Cisco, we, you know, Cisco invited him to join offside leadership, you know, meeting. He, he gave uh, uh, 10 leadership tips. This is one of them. So, oh, I see. yeah, he's such a great leader. So, Back to the, 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 you know, the corporate like Zoom, like how to have a promoted open, you know, transparent culture, make sure employees they can share their voices. It's very important, but also that's not easy. So from our perspective, I, I would say every employee is more like a, a, a family member. I want themselves to be themselves. Whenever they think about something, they got to speak up. Otherwise, a lot of our problems, our employees know that. If you do not share with others, guess what? Those problems will become bigger and bigger, right? So that's the reason why, how to make sure you cultivated a culture where every employee, they want to share their voices open and transparently. That's very important. You know, like we got to talk about it every time, every day. You know, give one example, like all hands meeting. So we have all hands meeting once, once every two weeks. We allow our employees to submit the questions anonymously. Any questions is fine. We are going to address that, you know, share the answer to our employees. Mm -hmm. Plus any employees, if they have any questions, we got to take those questions, questions seriously. Otherwise, if they share with what, if you do not pay attention to that, they are not going to share with you anymore. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, if you have a care culture, meaning every employee, if they truly care about the company, care about the teammates, they want to share with others. They want to, you know, share transparently, open, you know, the, the, you know, to others as well. But again, that's it's not that easy because, uh, especially for for you, hire a lot of new employees. They do not need, know each other well. How to make sure they still want to share what they're thinking is not that straightforward. That's one of the challenges we are facing almost every day. Are you surprised by some of the questions that come up? Not only do I feel surprised, in particular for our newly hired employees, you know, they heard about our oh, Zoom is great culture, it's a great company. The first time when they joined the all hands meeting, when they look at the questions, they say, wow, I never <laughs> thought about this. But also a lot of questions were surprised. The good news I told our employees, those questions came from our employees. Those employees are our family member. As no matter how surprised, how tough those questions sometimes are. Those questions are our employees' questions. We got to answer to those questions. So I want to switch gears a little and talk more about the technical side. Uh, so you've talked about how you want to make Zoom feel less virtual. So, so how are you thinking about AI and robotics and all these sorts of developments and folding them in? Yeah, very exciting. I think. Uh, I think we are living in, in a best time in terms of a technology revolution. We believe in the future, you know, the, the video communication like Zoom can even deliver a better experience than face-to-face -face meeting. Like I said, Tom, you and I, let's say we have uh, the coffee in Starbucks, let's say one hour in two or three months, very likely we might forget what we talk about. Mm -hmm. But with AI technology, every time after the meeting is over, to leverage AI to, to generate a, a very accurate meeting summary. It's very important. Also like, a, you know, the big town hall meeting and the participants, they, they, they may speak a different language. With AI, we can support a real time, live, you know, translation. You know, like a Tom, we did not see each other for a long time. But like this call, I want to shake hands with you. I'll give you a big Hi. hug you will feel that intimacy in the future. Even when you have a cup of a coffee, also can enjoy the smell remotely. I think those technology driven by AI or robotics or the you know, AR, I think can truly empower 
and uh, this kind of uh, communication like a Zoom to make it better and better and ultimately better than face-to-face -face meeting. Well, I, I look forward to that. I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a deal. We'll get together and uh, drink coffee via, uh, via Zoom, but I hope also in person <laughs> at some point. So I know you're a big basketball fan. Uh, so am I actually, <laughs> having grown up in the days of the New York Knicks, of the, of the, of the uh, Bill Bradley, Dave DeBusher days. Um, the, uh, but tell me, tell me how you think about uh, basketball analogies. Are there any? You know, do you think of your job as, as a dunk? Do you think of it as uh, a driving layup, a three-point shot? Where, where are you? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm too tall to, to dunk. So <laughs> the games, I really want to figure out, hey, when we can go back to watch the games. It's very exciting every time. And for now, it's just so unfortunate. Uh, again, I think I learned a lot by watching NBA games. You know, why the Warriors won champions several times, you know, how each team they treated their uh, players. That's why, you know, last year, you know, at our Zoom user conference, Zoomatopia, I also invited the Mark Cuban to, to join us oh, wow. cool. a lot. I think yeah. one thing I really, I think I learned, I also applied that to our business, you know, is that you look at an NBA game, a season, you know, the, the, every players, they work so hard. They got to win, you know, every game, every game, sometimes lost the game and is in good champion. And is in the final NBA champion and is in the celebrate and, and the summer break. Guess what? They need to start over. Again, again, and again. Right. Very similar to what we are doing, right? So we got to enjoy that process. Every day is more like a game. We won some business, we lost some business, but we got to move forward. Tomorrow, we need to prepare well to keep winning. Mm -hmm. And then end of the year, we have a very good year, and we celebrated that, we got to start over. Very similar to the way for NBA players, they play the game. I would say that business is ultimate sports. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, so many people are inspired by the, the kind of sports analogies in that fashion, the excellence and the individual achievement. Um, uh, I, I imagine, though, that the, the teamwork aspect of this must be particularly appealing to you. you. You are so right. The reason why my favorite NBA player is Andre Iguodala. He's not only our investor, but also, the, I, also we invited him, I think, for one of our all hands meetings. The number one thing we, we like, Andre, is teamwork spirit. He's a great team player. That's the number one thing, you know, for, for, for us to learn from, to learn from NBA players. You are so right, on. That's great. Well, well, Eric, this has just been so much fun, but, but I, I, I think I'm forced to share the fun, <laughs> if you will, with our, with our viewers. And uh, we have a number of questions. And uh, so I will start on those, if I may. Um, and the first one is from George Coe from the Caltech Alumni Association. Um, what were the technical challenges of scaling to the worldwide demand for a safe meeting platform in terms of handling traffic, security, expanding sales channels, and so forth? Yeah, George, that's a great question. If you asked me this question one year ago, I would say that's awesome. You know, we helped us a lot when we were facing the challenge last March. I think that you know, from a technology perspective, the number one thing is we have to add so many servers to accommodate uh, the like thirty times more the traffic. But actually, you know, if you look at our cloud, there's no way for us to add so many servers over the night. The good news, we can leverage the public cloud service offered by you know AWS or Amazon and Oracle. And over the night, one click, we can pro provision so many servers. That's the number one challenge we were facing. The good news with the partners like Amazon and Oracle, we survived. That's number one. Number two is monitor all the data center traffic in real time. Because suddenly, you know, we see we already have enough capacity. But guess what? Over the night, we might have, a, you know, 10 times more traffic. How to you know, monitor, that, monitor that traffic? and add more capacity in a timely manner. That's also very important. Last but not, not, but not least is about privacy and security practice. The reason why, you know, when we build a Zoom, 
our practice was on how to support enterprise customers. Take, let's take the privacy security features, for example. Normally, we work together with enterprise IT team. They are going to decide, enable, or, or disable those features. But when it comes to consumers, they do not have IT team. So we got to change our practice and process. We need to play the role of IT you know, to, to enable those some features as default for those uh, the consumers. Those are challenges. We never thought about that before the, 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 prim, the, 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 the pandemic you know, crisis. Right. Well, thank you, Eric. The, the, the second question follows actually on this first question. It's from Albert Whitsley. Uh, how successful have you been at both retaining the simplicity of Zoom for purchasers and users while rapidly implementing all these accoutrement security that you were talking about? It's obviously a, a push and a pull there. Um, and uh, are there lots of new modifications in the pipeline? I guess everyone wants to know what, what comes next. Yeah, that's a great, great question. I can, you know, tell you probably that's the number one thing when it comes to product development. I uh, meaning you know, the, the most of time I spent on before, even recently is when we get so many feature requests, when we try to add more and more features, how to keep the simplicity? Because to, to make the product, you know, comp complex is very easy. Because you, you have five features, you just add five menus or five buttons. That's very easy. But how to simplify the feature? How to make sure that you are as, as simple as possible, even if you add more, add more features? That's so hard. That's not easy. Quite often, we debate it a lot. Should we add this feature in a way to let the customer see that? Or should we let the customer configure that? It's, 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 again, that's an, you know, it's no one size you know, fits all the, the approach. But for every feature, we got to understand why do our users, they, they need this feature? What's the root cause? Do we have any other ways to support this feature without adding so many UI elements? It's very hard. And uh, it's, it's every day we are you know, talking about that, we are facing this kind of a balance. Uh, so one of the other aspects uh, is addressed in the next question from Gene Parker, which is uh, Zoom made an early commitment to accessibility and inclusion of people with disabilities and, and the use of assistive technology. Uh, can you talk a bit about why you made this commitment and how it has benefited the platform? So first of all, when we started, we do not know where the customers uh, could come from. And actually our first three customers all, uh, all, they were all from high ed universities or, or, or uh -huh. community colleges. That's why accessibility, we got a feedback, you know, very early on. And, uh, you know, accessibility is extremely important in the education market. And this is part of our company, the DNA. But even today, I think, you know, we still have a lot of features, accessibility features in the pipeline. You know, we, we, we got to, you know, the, the keep innovating. And uh, otherwise, I think, uh, you know, education market is also healthcare market is top two market. Without uh, supporting accessibility, I do not think, uh, you know, your customer, they are going to trust you. Not to mention, we got to care about the community, right? Uh, with the disabled, you know, users, I think we need to add more and more features to care about those users. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I know that's had a big impact and, and, and certainly for us, uh, in terms of our community, it's a very important aspect. Um, Art Goldstein asks, whom do you regard as Zoom's biggest competitor right now? But maybe the more interesting part of his question is, whom do you believe Zoom's biggest competitor might be five to 10 years from now? That's a great question. I think uh, as a matter of a fact, I would say our biggest competitor is ourselves. The reason why is because Seriously, it's the reason why is today you have a competitor A, tomorrow competitor B or C, you know, could it change all the time. However, if you always focus on your competitors, I think you, you might, you know, lose, you know, you know the, the, the focus. Because if you got to understand one thing is who is the most important when you build your business? Customer. If you focus on customer, focus on your own execution, keep working as hard as you can to keep, you know, to care about the customers, no matter who are your competitors, you'll be okay. You can survive. 
And the competitors probably just uh, you know uh, one aspect to, to kind of to, to let you keep working as hard as you can, otherwise others you know can catch up. But most important thing is to focus on your own execution. So with that aside, I think Zoom, you know, our competitor is still Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, Azita Sharif uh, writes a note that that sounds like one of the ones you might get after you talk to your customers. Um, a friend of mine in recovery wrote to you this summer to express her gratitude that Zoom made it possible for AA meetings to continue. You wrote her back personally and she was so thrilled. Thank you. My question, did you imagine how Zoom would be useful beyond business for things like allowing alcoholics to continue their recovery meetings or families to reunite across distances? Yeah, those use cases are very important because uh, as Zoom and not- should not be only used by business communications. How to, in overall, you know, the, the mission is how to have the people stay connected. How to leverage the Zoom platform, no matter where we live, even if I'm remote, how to make sure everyone, they can leverage a platform like Zoom to care about each other, to help them. Right? This is very important, more like how to contribute back. Sometimes I need to travel somewhere to contribute back to the, to the community, I do not think that's scalable. How to leverage tools like Zoom, that is very important. I think I, we truly like those uh, use cases. Yeah. So Anastasia Bulakaya asks, Zoom has an amazing data set on synchronous discussions, which can potentially be used to test social science theories about group dynamics, bias, and more. Are you partnering with any social science researchers to do basic research using some of that uh, appropriately, uh, you know, depersonalized data? Yeah, to some extent, yes. The reason why is, you know, Zoom was a killer app over the past several years. Our new dream, the next 10 years journey is to become a platform company. And that's the reason why we would like to partner with any third party developers or companies or partners. They either build the applications based on our API. Or if they all have an application and we can integrate it with Zoom, meaning within this Zoom interface, just one click, I can launch that social, you know, the, the you know, interface application and the group discussion, you know, application. I think that's uh, our platform play. But uh, however, I do not think that we have enough resources, right, to, to develop so many features like that. But we wanted to offer a platform to support others to build those kind of applications. Mm-hmm. So, so do you imagine that you would have a research, I mean, obviously you have a research arm in terms of developing the app, but do you imagine that you would uh, someday have a research arm within Zoom that would do this? Actually, yesterday we just had, had an internal hackathon, right? And our engineers, you know, think about, you know, how to develop some cool apps upon our platform. And I think as, as we further build up our platform, a vision, I think that we want to have a very healthy ecosystem, like some research group and internally, and also the partners. It's very important because quite often, I, I truly believe this is the future of a communication. It's not only bright, we just started. A lot of new ideas is still not born yet. So that's why there's some research group, either internally or, or, or joined by partners, is very important to drive the innovation. Oh, it's very exciting. We will, we will look forward to seeing that. And of course, the intersection with universities becomes much more natural in that fashion. So, I'm pretty sure the Caltech, very bright, smart students. And, uh, you know, we'll have a lot of great ideas, a lot of uh, great alumni from Caltech and the community also can help us too. Sounds great. Um, Elizabeth Coley uh, writes, Zoom is definitely part of the answer to reducing our carbon footprint for business air travel and for saving the planet. Have you considered how to replace or substitute for the face-to-face networking aspect of business meetings and conferences? I think you talked a little bit about this with AI and stuff, but it'd be good to hear about in this context. Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, climate change is real. It's very, very serious problem. We've got to look at this problem from all aspects. And, uh, you know, got to work together with, uh, with uh, researchers or, or scientists or the policy makers to, to address this problem. And video conferencing for sure is, uh, you know, one of the, the key pieces. We can save the carbon emissions, right? Like, uh, you know, for me, over the past several years, I only travel at most twice a year. I mean, business travels. 
you know, if I travel very often, for sure, on the one hand, Zoom may not work. On the other hand, you know, it will not help the uh, climate change, right? So that's why, you know, two years ago at our user conference, we, we give the, the, the award to the top three customers who saved, you know, tons of the carbon, you know, dioxide emissions, you know, like Oracle and uh, the Dell or other customers. As long as we keep talking about that, we realize, oh, I do not need to fly somewhere to meet with you. We can use Zoom. Not only do we use Zoom, but also what's more important is that we do contribute to the climate change. That's very important. It's more like awareness. You know, people, they, they start, quite often they take it for granted. They think, they do not think about just one meeting they can save, you know, uh, the, the, the tons of the carbon emissions. I think that's very important for everyone to realize that's very important. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see, as you point out, as we move forward out of the pandemic, how much of this survives and what you can do actually through Zoom to encourage this, because it does yeah. have huge implications for climate change. Yep. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, Cindy Hagen asks, with the crisis imposed on educators during the pandemic, you could have charged any amount of money for elementary, middle and high schools to use your platform. Yet you chose to provide these services to these groups free of charge. What led you to make this decision? And what were the sort of moral and personal financial implications um, um, of this? And you know, was a struggle in some sense to, to make those decisions? Yes, yes, great question. It boils down to our company's value. Our company's value is just one word, care. Meaning we care about the community, customer, company, teammates, as well as our sales. This is one thing I learned from John Chambers. He was a former CEO of Cisco. When you build a business, don't always think about how to you know, drive up your sales, your revenue, and always think about competition to win. Always think about what you can do to contribute back to the community, to society. That's, that's, that's what I learned. So when it comes to decision like this, I think it is no burden. Everyone at Zoom, we all think, yes, we should do that. And because education is extremely important. You know, K-12 schools, those kids, I think that, you know, they are going to suffer from that if they do not have a good tools. Plus a lot of public schools, they may not have IT team, they may not have enough budget. If we do not have some, if we do not offer the free service, if we do not have a summer academy to have those educators, I just feel like this conflict to have a company value. As, as long as this uh, pandemic crisis is still going on, I think we always wanted to offer the free service. We offered a you know, free service to more than, more than 125,000 schools and around 25 countries. Our employees, we feel very proud. This is a, you know, one thing I also like about the cynical mind. We all need to think about how to contribute back to the society. Well, it's a wonderful statement about investing in the future. So, yeah, thank you that way. So we talked a little bit about the increasing number of employees you have. And Yang Zhang asks, how do you retain employees in the highly dynamic Silicon Valley environment? Yeah, so again, that's, uh, that's not that easy because uh, there's so many great companies all there, so many great opportunities all there. So it's really hard to tell employees, hey, you got to work for us. So the way for us to look at this is how to build a happiness culture. Make sure employees, when they work for you, they realize they can learn a lot. They can become a better version of themselves. And also, and they know they are part of the big vision to contribute to society. And also, if you have a great culture, hopefully the business-wise also doing very well, employees also can get a good financial return. That's also important too, mm -hmm. right? First of all, I think painting a picture of the company, the vision, build a great culture and make sure they enjoy working for you. Every day they come to office or they work remotely, they are very happy. And finally also get a good financial return. I think those are very important thing for us to retain our employees. Very good. Um, you, you talked about music and, and Bill Haynes uh, writes in, are you working on methods to allow real-time performance of music from multiple locations? Yeah. I. Last year, I joined in quite a few Zoom meetings. Uh, you know, they they played you know the band together, and uh, you know from different locations. I realized it's pretty challenging, especially when when you know the party they have uh, very low bandwidth. 
it's really hard for the group music play. So this is one of the, the biggest uh, technical problems our team is still working on. I hope some of the, the Caltech, I think uh, alumni can help us. This is one of the most difficult problems mm. we, we, have, we got to address. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, I think, an important one in that one wonders how the great symphonies and the various chamber groups are going to survive the, the pandemic. And there may be a need for these sorts of hybrid solutions. Yep. Yeah. Um, Raj Das asks about your plans in the medical field. He, he suggests that uh, the field really needs disruption and, and could, <laughs> could use a contribution from Zoom. Have you been thinking about that? Yeah, good news, I think uh, telemedicine, telehealth, and uh, are going to become mainstream. You know, that's, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I talked to many other, you know, the uh, customers from either medical school or from hospitals. I think uh, during this pandemic crisis, a lot of calls are on uh, are video calls, right? Having said that, I think we just started. Like how to, you know, the, the seamlessly integrated the technology like uh, video conferencing, like Zoom, with uh, medical, you know, the field, like, uh, hey, like uh, the surgery, right? and also with, uh, you know, with uh, the training, and the plus with the AR, and all those kind of things, I think will, will create a lot of uh, revolu revolutionary and the solutions. And the technology and the medical field, I think the remote, you know, the patient care and like, you know, the, the, the seniors, right? So when they are at home, how to level technology someone remotely, uh, assuming there's no privacy security problem, they can take care of those seniors. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, use cases, I think is, uh, you know, very important in the future. Yeah. Uh Part of what we were talking about before, that there will be good things that come out of, uh, yep. <laughs> out of this uh, pandemic. Yep. Um, so Wayne Huber asks, can you comment on the hardest technical challenges of creating the Zoom network? Uh, there's so many challenges, but uh, in terms of technical challenges, I would say is uh, how to keep a good quality of video and, and audio you know, a very, I would say poor, you know, the, the not a reliable network. Mm. Like sometimes, you know, and in my home, I have a, sometimes, sometimes I have a four, you know, Zoom uh, the calls, right? You know, Wi-Fi network is really, you know, not good enough. It's like a, sometimes a 3G or 4G network. You have very, very low bandwidth. How can you support that kind of a network environment? Still give a, a good quality of audio and sometimes video, that's very challenging. That's ongoing effort. That's the first one. A second one is about the noise, noise reduction. Now, sometimes, you know, you may not see the noise in most of the meetings, but sometimes how to, you know, the, the focus on the, the noise reduction without consuming a lot of CPU power, that's another challenge and the ongoing challenge. Mm. Well, continuing challenges, as you point out. Um, and, and Michael Mazur, a Caltech graduate student, uh, asked about a different sort of challenge, which was how you navigated the uncertainty in leaving one job to start a new company. And, and you talked a little bit about that, but uh, uh, are there lessons you can give our students about that as they head out? I think, first of all, it boils down to, you know, do you have a dream or not, right? So if you do not have a dream, you know, enjoy what you're doing today, absolutely okay. You know, keep learning, keep thinking about how you can become a better version of yourself until you have a big dream. That's absolutely fine. However, when you are ready, you see suddenly you have a big dream. When you have a big dream, I think for sure, for anyone to realize a big dream, a dream, you, you will always, uh, you know, face all kinds of challenges or uncertainties. That's a given. But however, because of that, you can learn from that you can become even a better version of yourself. Otherwise, you, you cannot achieve those kind of great dreams. There's back to the, you know, we just talk about that. You got to enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. And how to enjoy the process, face those uncertainties, fix those uh, the problems, overcome those difficulties, and it become a better version of yourself and also enjoy that process. I think that's a way for me to look at that. I see. Oh, that, that, that's wonderful advice, actually. Um, we have time for one more question, which is from Sharon Chen, who's a graduate student at Caltech. And 
She writes, I read in your Time Business Person of the Year 2020 interview that you would prefer to go back into the product side after the pandemic. So, so tell us a little bit about that and, and how you feel about being a public figure and uh, <laughs> whatever you can fit into two minutes. <laughs> yeah, so I just shared with our team and share the top three priorities I'm going to work on you know, this year, next several years. Because you know, for, for every business, like normally when you start a business, you got to start a product side. You got to promote the product culture because the product is a key. For the first several years, it's always like that. Otherwise, you cannot have a customers. However, after a while, after you have product ready, you got to focus on the go to market. It's more like a sales culture. After a while, you got to go back to product culture. Essentially, you got to take the turn, product culture, go to market, sales culture, and then product culture. I think for us, our next 10 years journey, we will become a platform company. I feel like I need to go back, mm-hmm. you know, to sort of transform our business from a go-to-market sales culture to a product culture to lay out a solid foundation for the next 10 years. That's why I shifted my personal priority to focus on the, the product. Maybe next four or five years after the platform ready, I will go back to the, to the go-to-market mm-hmm. side, take the return. Well, we look forward to learning about uh, the continuing saga and and the continuing contributions. Thank you so much for for joining us, Eric. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for all the audience. I really appreciate it for your invitation. Thank you. Oh, it's terrific. And I want to thank the audience as well, both for their attention and for the uh, uh, wonderful questions that they posed. And uh, I'll look forward to our next intersection. Thanks, everyone.